please rise as you're able and join me in the call to worship as, as printed in your worship guide. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, who redeems us from sin and death. For us and for the salvation of all, Christ became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We invite you to remain risen as you're able and join in singing hymn number 243 in the African American Heritage Hymnal, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Friends, we invite you to be seated. During our time of prayer today, I'll lift petitions on behalf of the church, the world, and our community. During the following moments of silence, you are invited either in the silence of your own hearts or aloud in our sanctuary to offer your specific prayers related to that petition. After a moment, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and invite you to respond with, receive our prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we meet beside your cross this day. We meet as strangers, friends, and traveling companions on the redemption road, all of us grieving for the loss of love in the world, longing to understand how such violence persists and what role you have called us to serve in its undoing. And in our meeting, we pray for those hung upon the crosses of this present age, for mothers whose sons have been murdered, and those abandoned by those whom they've called friend. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. For those who are left to hunger and without homes because of our greed and overconsumption, Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. For those more comfortable with the privilege and power provided by their station, skin color, socioeconomic status, and religion, then following your command to stand in solidarity with those who live on the world's margins.
Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. For those for whom illness, pain, and the fear of death is a constant companion, and all those who cry out, Jesus, remember me. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, make us companions with you and with these, your beloved, in their suffering, that in our solidarity we might find strength for the living of these days and hope that despite the present depth of this darkness, Easter still comes. Amen. Let us pause now and recollect the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ and the agony that he suffered on the cross. We invite you to find a posture that will allow both heart and mind as well as body to receive this reading from the gospel according to John, starting in the 18th chapter, beginning with the first verse. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priest and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malachus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup? that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was, with, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, 
I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus in the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him a bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out with them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, This man, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or do others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. 
he entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked him, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine onto a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he feared, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed the body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Receive what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God.
progressive Christian circles. There are many a joke and aspersion directed toward what are often called the blood hymns. For ages, Christians have sung, as we've just heard, sung with gusto about the wonder-working power of the blood of the Lamb, about being washed in the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus will cleanse from sin. And on it goes. For some, the concern with these songs is theological. For others, perhaps they just find the whole concept and focus distasteful or weird. But the truth is that blood is at the center of our faith story. And it's important to consider why. In the ancient world, blood was a powerful symbol of life itself. And our Judeo-Christian spiritual tradition from ancient times until now holds that God is the source and the sustainer of life. So the symbolic connection between blood and life and God is deep. The Passover our Jewish siblings observe beginning tonight commemorates their liberation from slavery in Egypt. The Seder, the ritual meal, recounts the story of the Exodus, including the ritual of the Passover lamb. The lamb whose blood in the original story was wiped on the doorpost as a sign calling for God's mercy. For those inside that house to be passed over or spared from what was the final plague upon Egypt and the slave masters. That plague is sometimes described as the angel of death. In the story, the blood, the power of life given by God, the blood is protection against death. Embedded in this archetypal story of our faith are themes of oppression, of liberation, of God's saving love and presence, of sacrifice, and of blood. It's not hard to understand why we make a connection between the sacrificial lamb of the Passover and Jesus. Both the lamb and Jesus are innocent. Both the lamb and Jesus are killed. Both the lamb and Jesus are involved in a larger story that has to do with oppression and with liberation. And the way the equation often gets presented, just as the blood-marked doorposts provided protection for the enslaved Israelites in Egypt, being washed in the blood of Jesus marks us for mercy, saves us from judgment and from death, and brings liberation. Now, I believe there's a lot of deep truth in that. But oh my, do we get it twisted. The familiar phrase, quote, Jesus died for me, makes it sound as though I don't have to die, even though Jesus both taught and modeled that to follow him required that we lose our lives. Jesus died for my sins makes it sound like I don't have to take any responsibility for my sins. 
including my complicity with the kind of sin that put Jesus on the cross in the first place. Quote, Jesus came to die, makes it sound like God's plan and focus is death. When in fact, the whole point is life, life and more life. And not just for me, but for the whole creation. Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could bathe in his blood in some macabre way or magical way in order to get out of suffering or accountability. Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could wear the cross as an ornament instead of carry it as a calling to mercy and justice and self-giving love for all. Jesus' blood represents Jesus' life. Blood, life. And Jesus' life is a life that showed us what God's love looks like when it's fully human. That love is seen in gentleness and courage and humility and wisdom and radical inclusion and justice and solidarity with the suffering and the oppressed. Jesus' flesh and blood were offered to us not just on the cross, but from the moment of the incarnation. Jesus' blood, Jesus' life, had wonder-working power from the beginning. What if every time we think about or hear someone singing about the saving power of Jesus' blood We think not only of the blood of the cross, but of when the blood was flowing through Jesus' living body as he reached out to embrace and to include women in his inner circle, as he perceived the persons around the edges who no one else gave any notice, as he went toe-to-toe with the most unstable, violent, power-hungry leaders of the local Roman imperial rule for the sake of justice for the poor, as he gathered the children around him with gentleness and joy, as he taught that all people, not just certain tribes or classes, have dignity and worth and the capacity to participate in the mighty acts of God's salvation. As he moved through conflict, as we heard in the story today with strength and clarity, but without violent retaliation. As he had compassion for both the outcast poor and the outcast rich. As he showed us how to truly love God and neighbor. The reason Jesus' blood flowing from the cross matters so much is that it is the blood, the life, the love that revealed God's perfect love for us. Jesus had blood the whole time. And who he was and what he said and did before he was killed is what makes the cross in any way sensible or saving. Jesus' blood freely shed is a confirmation and an affirmation of everything he had done in his life. It proves he wasn't just trying to win a popularity contest or show how awesome he was. He wasn't just saying that he loved us, wasn't just pretending that he was in solidarity with the poor and with all the innocents who are slain, not just pretending that justice and mercy were at the heart of his ministry. The blood proves it all. It proves that God's love for us proves God's love for us because while we were yet sinners, Jesus' love and solidarity remained steadfast and that meant suffering 
and death. The blood of Jesus is both convicting and hopeful. It's convicting because it reveals our own capacity to do violence, to kill, to reject love, to reject the call to justice and mercy. But the blood also gives hope because the self-sacrifice of Jesus shows that even, even when you, even when I, even when you're at your very worst, even when you have betrayed love or denied love or hurt others or slandered someone or failed to acknowledge your participation in the systems of injustice in which we all swim, that even then God loves you and will stand up for you even then to the point of death. Because the same compassion and love and mercy that Jesus showed in life is the same compassion and love and mercy that flows from his head and his hands and his feet. The blood of Jesus, the Jesus way of life. Do you see this connection? The blood of Jesus and the life of Jesus. The way of life, the way of love, the Jesus way of forgiveness, the Jesus way of self-giving, the Jesus way of communion with God. When that blood marks your life, you move toward liberation. You move toward a life free from the fear of death. When the blood, the life of Christ marks you, then you will begin to understand what it means when Jesus says you have to lose your life to save it. And you'll give thanks for the dignity and the challenge of so great a call. You'll give thanks for the gift of this wonderful, wonder-working, new life. May it be so. Thank you, Pastor Ginger, for that message. And let us continue in a spirit of contemplation and reflection as we prepare our tithes and offerings. Know that your gifts today help our congregation fulfill its commitment to create beloved community and to envision a world in which the oppression epitomized in the violence of the cross is no longer a threat to God's beloved children. When you give, your gifts support missions of justice, mercy, and advocacy. Now as our usher comes forward, ushers come forward, we pray that you give as the Spirit leads. And please join us in singing Through the Blood, which you can find in the Amer African American Hymnal on page 259. <laughs> Thank you. 
Friends, today we remember the amazing grace and gift of the blood of Jesus that has been shared with us in so many ways that we might have life, that we might be set free from fear to live more abundantly and fully, not just for ourselves, but for others in the way of Jesus, who shows us what human lo life looks like when it's being lived as it was made to be. We'll close our service by singing and following the conclusion of our hymn, we invite you to do a number of things as the Spirit leads. You may leave the sanctuary in silence or come forward to our altar rail to pray. You may come to the chancel steps to pray around the cross in adoration and prayer as a gesture of community with all of those who are suffering in our broken world. If you choose to pray around the cross, you may follow an ancient Eastern custom and kneel down to touch the cross. With this gesture, you symbolize entrusting to Christ your burdens and the burdens of those closest to you. We'll invite you to move into any of these spaces following the singing of our closing hymn, which is, Were You There? It's found in the United Methodist hymnal, the Red United Methodist hymnal, on page 228. We'll sing verses 1 through 3 and 5. Let us rise as we're able to sing.
in the space of emptiness, in the space of silence, in the space of loss and grief. Let us remember that there is no suffering or pain that our God does not fully understand. Therefore, God is with us even now. Receive the blessing of that promise as we move through the hours and day to come and this long night. Amen.